In a small town nestled in the canyonlands at the base of Rabideers Pass, along the northern stretch of the Colorado River, there's a monster athlete named Chris Burant. In Burant's strange world, he rides a Polaris snowmobile almost every day of the winter. It snows incessantly, and people come from all over the world just to ride with him. East Coast, West Coast, Canada, Japan, or Sweden, wherever they come from, they always leave Colorado with a one-off, never to forget, Burant's backcountry adventure. Let's take a step back to 2010, the winter before last. Chris had just made the controversial jump to Polaris, and you could feel the silent anticipation in the clients, the burning question, would Burant come out on top? Armed with the new fleet of turbo dragons, Chris turned heads and silenced the critics. A new era in Burant's backcountry adventures had begun. Let's start the damn session. Just 
when I tell you I'm in it, spin it, begin it. Eva, keep on killing this rhythm after it's finished. Never once a week and you're weak and I won't diminish. On your marks, yeah, get set, go, now you can win it. Selection, reflection, bounce off the ball. Take them all out, knee highs to nine foot tall. Make them call out if they really, really want it. Sun rose, surprise, they're still really, really on it. I'm impressed. Levels bounce high on the depths. We should do a remix, cause still we won't rest. It's a blazer, belt for your parties and your festivals. Blows to the clubs, I'll make your mood sensational. So much around, but we say original. Double on the doses and never serve the minimal. Night times our time to strike the slight criminal. So when I say yeah, you better take it to the pinnacle. first glance, Chris may come off a little overconfident. But even if you know nothing about Chris, or backcountry snowmobiling in general, the moment he wraps his hands around a thumb throttle, you know you're watching a professional athlete dominating the top of the game. Given Chris's career achievements and game-changing contributions to steep backcountry snowmobiling, maybe some confidence is well earned. And without question, when you factor in Brant's humble beginnings. My wife and I basically started this on our own. We brought in uh, my mother-in-law to do the cooking. And for the first year, it was me riding, wrenching, digging. And uh, that caused a chaotic, crazy year. And as we increased our client base, uh, we also needed to increase uh, our level of professionalism. In 2009, Chris brought in Sane Skinner, a young kid from Wyoming with promising talent. We wanted to offer our clients the ultimate backcountry adventure where everything was first class. Everything from the snowmobile, the riding, the lodging, the food, that was very important to us and we are amazed at our return client base and how they bring more people to us and it's because of the service that we provide and how we look at each customer as a friend of ours and they really feel like this is something that is special to them and a reason for them to come back. For the 2011 season, Chris made a big investment and took a big step up. We uh, actually got access to 10,000 of our own private acres that only we get to ride. On this 10,000 acres, we've got an awesome shop, a lodge that it's located up in the woods. You gotta ride your snowmobile into it. 
It's pretty cool when the clients wake up in the morning, the first thing they see when they wake up off the decks is they actually see the riding area that we're gonna be riding that day. And, and I mean, the views are absolutely incredible and, and I just pinch myself every day and realize that I'm the only one who gets to poach tracks in this thing, so it's pretty cool. The things that we really try to focus on here is we try to make this a very personable experience. So all of our clients stay uh, together in, in one house, the lodge. Um, we have a separate dining area that uh, all the, the meals are served at. So um, many many of our repeat customers, I don't think they'd come back if we uh, if we fired one of the cooks because uh, cooking is probably one of the best attributes of this deal. Um, and then there's the riding. I mean, the riding is, is just insane. To have actually 10,000 acres that only you can ride. Um, I mean, we've been riding it for three months now, and we've touched about that much of it. And so that's pretty exciting, and uh, it's pretty neat that our customers are actually getting to explore this for the first time with us. So it's pretty cool. Superheroes need sidekicks. And the general consensus is that Chris chose wisely in Saiyan Skinner. So I've had a lot of fun with my sidekick Saiyan Skinner this year. It's been really neat to see him evolve from a kind of out of control rider into a very controlled and technical rider. And you'll see that in his riding. I think, I think my, my riding is slowly but steadily progressing. Um, I think a lot of it is attitude and having fun with your buddies and being able to trust the people you're with. That, that has a lot to do with being comfortable just in case something ever goes wrong. Uh, being able to trust the people that you're with is, is huge to me and that helps a lot. Don't break my snowmobile, we got a lot of film on the Oh, that's right, it's your sweats. One big accomplishment for Sam this year, in my opinion, is that he was actually able to ride his own two sleds all year without even having to borrow one of mine. And so that was uh, a big feat for him, and really, that was way better for me. <laughs> On the turbo, I love that thing. It's just your white knuckle, you're out of control, you're in a four foot wheelie, you can't see where you're going, your goggles are all covered in snow and there's willows everywhere or, or branches and you're just laughing because you have no idea where you're going. You have 200 horsepower on tap and you're on this hill, it's so steep you can touch and there's an open river in the bottom, you have no option of going down. You're completely out of control and somehow you just you thread the needle and it's just the coolest feeling. It's no secret that days tend to run long at Barant's Backcountry Adventure. For those of you who think I just get to ride my snowmobile every day, uh, I've got a little bit of news for you. A day in the life of Chris Brandt starts off at about 6.30 in the morning, 
I gotta check email because I wasn't able to do that the night before because I didn't get done writing until 7 and then we did dinner at 8. Didn't get home till 9, got to play with my kid till 9.30 and was so physically exhausted I couldn't keep my eyes open to check emails. 8 o'clock, go up to the ranch to make sure sleds are all dialed in for the beginning of the day. All of this time in the morning, I'm trying to figure out where I want to ride, wondering what the skill level of my client base is going to be for the day. And breakfast time is actually a really fun time for me. I love eating. From there, we're looking at uh, filling up sleds, topping them off with oil. We'll end up finding a random thing wrong with a sled, so then we got to work on sleds for about 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Uh, then we get to go and ride. And from about 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock, this is the fun time for me. This is where I actually get to take some time and, and show these people the passion that I have for this sport and why I love it. And, and I pinch myself every day that I do get paid to go ride, which is really crazy. Um, after we're done riding, then the work begins again. Uh, we do get to do some dinner, which is I think my second favorite part of the day. This is a time I enjoy. I get to mingle with the clients. We're talking stories about how cool and crazy the day was. And um, that's, that's a really fun time for me. And these strangers that I've never met before, um, I've invited into my world and, and we become friends. And, and that's what this sport is all about. We're all very passionate about the sport of snowmobiling. And we don't do it because it's cheap. I mean, this sport, this sport is ridiculously expensive. We just do this because we love it, and it's pretty neat to be wrapped around the, the same type of person that I am and get to mingle with these people on a daily basis. Keeping up with Chris isn't so easy. And just to prove it, here's some anecdotal evidence from when we tried to squeeze in some evening interviews. How do you feel most comfortable talking? I don't know, I'm sleeping. <laughs> oh, long days, George. So, Brandon, what's your name? What? What's your name? <laughs> are you tired? Yes. Can you repeat, like, if I say, what do you do for a living, say, I ride snowmobiles for a living? Yes, sir. <laughs> It's cool, I can do that, yeah. <laughs> or, or my name is Sam Skinner, let me do that. Alrighty. My name is Sam Skinner's. <laughs> there may be some misconceptions about what you get when you sign up for a Barant backcountry adventure. Tricked out sled, top of the line lodging, and awesome food. But that doesn't mean that things always go according to plan. On a true adventure, it's quite probable many things will go wrong. You might get lost, run out of gas. You might fall off your sled on a ridiculously steep hill and watch as your sled beelines into a tree and somehow comes out safe. Some of the best days with Chris in the thick of it feel like the worst day of your life, but that's the essence of a true backcountry adventure, one you will remember for the rest of your life. The most common adventure with Brant is getting stuck. Chris is never apologetic about taking you to the deep end, pushing you beyond your limits, and making grown men want to cry. There was this one day where Chris led us up this tight ravine. It was about 30 feet off a pack trail, but we were about to spend the next four hours stuck. Chris buried his short track on the first line, and then George, <laughs> from behind the camera, kept waving everybody on into the bottomless pit, creating a pile up of buried sleds lining the walls of the drainage. <laughs> you want me to? Yeah, wave this guy up too, George. <laughs> It was getting uglier by the moment. The pits were getting deeper, swallowing sleds whole. Even Chris was having a rough day. He buried his short track so many times it was getting tough to keep count. Chris was hell-bent on riding his short track up this ravine, 
probably because Sam put the first clean line through to the top on Chris's long track. Chris wasn't about to let this one go. Not to mention the fact that Sam was laughing and talking trash the whole time. I give it a three! <laughs> three! Yeah, ten. That was even hard. Come on. Okay, someone else's turn. That was sick footage. This one particular uh, drainage, I was having an off day and uh, I was trying to do something a little over the capability of maybe my little short track I was riding that day and or maybe some bad decisions in, um, in line choice. So it's pretty important. You cannot be afraid to get stuck because if you're afraid of getting stuck, you're never going to get better. I mean, getting stuck's just part of it. So wait, what was that again, Chris? So uh, Sam obviously got distracted and wanted to do something cool in front of the camera and forgot that he was riding on a 45 degree slope with some trees on the hill. What Chris seems to be saying is that although you shouldn't be afraid of getting stuck, you should be afraid of doing something dumb in front of the camera because it's going in the movie. When Barant stepped up to a five-star mountain lodge and a wholly private riding area, he not only ratcheted up the quality of his guiding service, he drove his logistical complexity through the roof. What many people don't see on the surface of running a, a backcountry tour business is all of the crazy logistics to actually make this business happen. I mean, the sled keep up, trying to get up to our lodge in the middle of winter during a blizzard, trying to have enough food on hand to feed an army of 10 people. Um, the list goes on and on and on and it's, it's on the surface it looks like I just have a job that I get to go ride snowmobiles every day, which that is the easy part of my job. The hard part of my job is making sure this business runs as smoothly as I want it to, to give my customers the experience that they want to have when they come here. For the 2011 season, Chris expanded the Barant's backcountry family by adding a full-time mechanic to the operation. I've uh, known Chris for a long time. He's been a really good family friend of mine. Our parents rode together, uh, working on sleds with him when he was racing. This is a snowflower, the first one of its kind. Chris made it on his adventure on this mountain. I actually just moved back to Colorado, so he asked me if I wanted to work for him and be his mechanic. So jumped at the shot and it's been really fun. Uh, an average day for me is being woken up by Sam, usually running into my room, quick slap in the face to wake up. Uh, and then we usually load up whatever we need to, tools or parts, and uh, head on up to the lodge. Um, usually we get to fix some stuff before we get to eat, and then uh, pretty much they go ride and I stay back. and. I work on all the broken stuff and they usually bring me more when they come home, so I, I fix a lot of stuff. Early in the season, the Mountain Lodge proved to be a little more remote than the team had anticipated. We have a two mile road between the lodge and the shop. We end up getting some freakish snowstorms. And uh, Chris was just trying to get me and Justin to keep this road open non-stop. We end up one day 16 hours in the skid steer with a blower to go two miles. It took forever and I'm all hyped up on Monster and iPod jamming, running off the road. The next morning it goes right back in. We have these eight foot walls. We thought about just building a tunnel and the wind out here is just such a crazy force. 
Once the team had abandoned plowing the paved roads, the lodge became truly remote. Another challenge around here for myself and Justin is to get the clients everything they need when it comes to food and their clothes up, up to the top. And we use a Plurist Ranger and it's just been awesome. We have a cab kit and a heater and, and it's got track. And it's a pretty sweet little, sweet little rig. And we've got that thing stuck, I don't know how many times, trying to build trails. And, we're building catwalks with shovels and the groomer helps us out here and there, but it, it's just it's pretty crazy. At one point, we asked Chris about how things were going with his new mechanic. His response seemed to be directly aimed at saying, How's your new mechanic? We're trying to pinpoint our movements. So he, he takes five steps and we do it all in one step. Like I would like to like I would like you guys to count how many head shakes I do in a day. Like Wait a minute. Those. Towards us or towards other people? I'm at least up to like ten just in the hour and a half I've been in the shop. That's because it doesn't know what we're gonna do. Is this side of this? This is my 11th year filming a snowmobile video. I've been doing Sledneks now since Sledneks 3 and we're filming for Sledneks 14 this year. And it's so cool to be able to look back and see the progression of my riding from the Hucker days to the more technical, uh, always in control most of the time feeling that I have now when I ride. Here's what I have to say about filming. It sucks. I hate filming. It is the furthest away from actual riding that you can get. It's almost like torture because you're on one of those three foot pow bluebird days and you just want to go shred it up and you're waiting on filmers all day long. Now I know you guys are probably saying cry me a river, but just do this. Next time you have one of those epic days, Go only ride half the day and don't go to the places that you actually really wanted to go and then go back to the truck and say you had a good day. Chris may have a point, but there's always two sides to his story. From the filming side, well there's the time Chris ran over the ridiculously expensive camera crane, or the countless POV cameras that get scratched, lost, and broken along the way. So. George gave me this high-tech device that supposedly was supposed to record something, and I ruined it in two days. Sorry. I'll work on not destroying things. Yeah, How about this hot dogger? <laughs> this thing's, uh, cooked some food in its day. There's my foot. There's the track. There's my foot. There's the track. I think this track skinned my thumb. <laughs> hey, George! Get a shot of Brendan. <laughs> Dude, you stayed in it for the long haul. One of my favorite filmer lines has got to be, can you do that just one more time for me? And I'm looking at him like, where? Are you kidding me? I just took all of the snow off of the line. It was a one in a hundred shot of me actually sticking it, and I actually did, and now you want me to do it again. They really tried to set me up for failure. Another say of mine? Yeah, I'm always... Oh, oh wait, wait, I gotta film this. No, 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 no. Wait a second! Don't do anything stupid yet! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold on! Calm down! Oh, it looks awesome! It looks awesome! Now you can be there. Dude, there's a big scene down here. That's kind of what filming is all about, but what it does for me and why I really truly love filming is that it makes me push myself past my comfort zone and makes me do things that I normally wouldn't have done, but once you do it and you do it right, it is amazing the confidence it gives you in all, all the other aspects of the writing you do. But a bill has come, it's marked on Right.
<laughs> this is BS. What is it? March, April, May? I don't know. March. March 20 something. 24th. It's deep, but there's a layer underneath it. Every now and then just reaches up and pistol whips you. But at the end of even the longest, most challenging days, love and hate are somewhere entangled with unforgettable moments. And regardless of which side of the camera lens you stand, everyone in Barant's world walks away with the adventure of a life. Was it a sick shot? I hate filming. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love you guys. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> but it's a lot of work. <laughs> Sometimes the adventure is about getting lost. I'm lost. Again. <laughs> lost in the truck this time, though. At the end of the 2010 season, Chris went in search of a new riding spot. It existed on a map, but mostly in Chris's head. It was looking bleak with the five truck and trailer entourage stranded up a narrow dead end road. But Chris got his bearings, and 15 minutes later, we found the sickest new riding spot. Down the hill together. It was nice. Towards the end of the day, Brett stumbled onto a sketchy line and dared Chris to do it. Chris decided to exercise the rock, paper, scissors clause in Saiyan's employment contract. Yeah! You're up! I'd have bet a dollar on this one. This is a tough line. Really tough line. That didn't break up. <laughs> okay, that's my line for the day. <laughs> when riding with the Brant team, there's always spectacular moments that stand out, etched into the back of your mind. Here's one of Saiyan's most memorable moments, caught on film. It's me and the filmers are hanging out in the back just messing around like we always do, and we find these 
huge walls, these, these big pillows on the side of the road. And George somehow coaxes me into riding my turbo up there as fast as I can go and doing something stooped off of and end up landing completely on my side on the actual road, like, I don't know, 15 or 18 feet out of the air. We're just laughing and somehow shoot off the side of the road and endo, and, but we stuck the extra shot, so it was a lot of fun. Late in the season, we got a storm that buried Chris's ranch. In April, we were scoring some of the deepest powder shots of the season. I've said the deepest day of the year like four times already this year. Dude, I want to hit that thing at about 30 and jump down there. Yeah. That's what we were wondering. Are you guys alright with that? Yeah. I'm alright with that. Good. They said to go left. Yeah, well, sitting on my left left. Yeah. That's right, that's a good line. Hey, I always smash my hand on those trees. Saying is referring to earlier in the season when he and Chris were filming for a Polaris commercial. We were filming and I dropped a uh, clip, a little, like a little whip hit, and we actually missed the shot, so I had to do it again, went bigger and bounced into a tree and smashed my hand uh, between my brake and the tree. And I ripped my hand out and it was just like spewing blood everywhere. Just like, for two feet it was sick. Pretty cool. Instantly black, the entire finger. And that was like, probably seven weeks ago. Now the fingernail's starting to fall off, so we'll just rip it off. Is that bad? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna take them off, because it snagged on there today and ripped another chunk of it off. So I might just, yeah. it's about time to just we take the baby off. We'll see. Does that hurt? Yeah, it already hurts, Rudy. Oh. Is it bleeding? Cute, huh, buddy? Oh. That does not feel good. That took a lot of pull to get that out. Squeaky clean. Oh, that is sensitive. That is an ugly finger, dude. This is so gross, but it's kind of cool. Ugh. All right, garbage. Chris makes side hilling look like an art, but for those who have watched the schooled movies, it's clearly a science.
buddy. One thing I always look forward to in the spring is dirt. By April time, I've had over 100 days on my snowmobile and I am ready for a break. And something that we've been playing with the last couple years is the Polaris Razor. This is probably one of the funnest things you could ever do on dirt. You can throw someone who will be scared to death in the passenger seat and go out and rally these things to death and jump, rock crawl, everything under the sun. And we just go out and have an awesome time. And that gives us plenty of time for the sun to soften up the snow to have epic conditions for an after lunch ride on our sled. Chris started the day off in the Bobcat, converting his 50 track into a razor course. While Chris was building his dream track, Sand was chomping at the bit. Sure enough, here comes Sand, buzzing around in his razor, impatient as he always is, ends up hitting one of the jumps before I got the landing built. Me and Justin end up doing a sick drift around George and hitting the tabletop completely out of control. So we're flying through the air, I'm winding up on the steering wheel, Justin's screaming like a 12 year old girl that just got a pony for her birthday, and end up annihilating what sounded like my entire razor. Justin's like, we broke it for sure, we broke it for sure. Look over and Brian's giving me the old nod like he always does. It was pretty fun. We completely missed the landing that way. It was still smooth though. <laughs> again? Let's try it again? Probably the coolest thing about a razor is you can beat the living crap out of this thing and at the end of the day you hose it off, throw it in the shop and you're good to go the next day. When I ride with Sane in his razor, I hold on very tightly and I scream a lot. Uh, I prefer to ride with Chris, he's a little more controlled. I think my favorite aspect about the Polaris razor is that it's very multi-purpose used, much like a sled. We took the skid steer and I had a bunch of these huge, big logs and we just threw them down in this little, little canyon that I've got on the property. And I think this is probably the most fun I have in the Razor is the very slow, technical rock crawling, trying to get over obstacles. You're using a lot of throttle control. You're reading the train. All the same things that I do on my sled. I really have a lot of fun doing that in the Razor. Things are going 
great. I was pulling some lines, getting over all the obstacles, all up until the very last obstacle. We were up against this wall, and I ended up pretty much getting served and rolling the thing over. So at the end of the day, Chris goes in, his family just got home, and I remember George asking Chris if he could hit this new jump that Chris just built, and Chris was like, yeah, sure, you know, whatever, you can take it for a rip. So about 25 laps later, George is just rallying everything, just killing it, and we get a bright idea that we go start racing things, and we GoPro everything up. So George, my dear friend, we love him to death, but he parks his huge Dodge pickup right in the middle of the entire track with the sled bed. You're in a full-on drift, completely out of control, and you're two feet away from George's truck. We came around turn four, AKA George's truck, and I ended up bumping the old berm a little bit with the back end, and I ended up slamming on the brakes. And we couldn't endo any harder than me and Justin did. Little did we forget that George and Brendan are right behind us in the other radio, literally three feet behind us and almost killed all. The only responsible person, which is me, on the track leaves for five minutes. And the filmers and Saiyan, I'm sure Saiyan was a big instigator in this, decided to have a race. What neither Chris nor Saiyan could have known is that George, who typically stands behind the camera, mistakenly believes himself to be the next Robbie Gordon of off-road racing. And in Chris's backyard razor track, George had something to prove. <laughs> Chris comes out on, on the dirt bike and he gives me one of these and that always means no good. I look back and I just see rubber in the air and George dangling it in, in the seat belt. It was, it was pretty dang funny. Fuel leaking everywhere, dust, just, it was awesome. This, this, is a, this is a line that I've used in snowmobiling many times. He failed to negotiate the train properly because he ran out of talent. Just proves that I'm the better driver once again. Thanks, George. My queen of the Bronx Blue eyes and spitfire I saw you walking back and forth About another boy Thinking that you may want to leave So give me All the business stuff aside, I truly do have the best job that one could ever have. I mean, my job is basically to go out and take passionate snowmobilers out into my element, go get them stuck, go get them so tired that they don't even think they can make it back to the truck, and then I get to go do it for the very next day. And And, and it's so neat to be able to show these people the, the passion that I have for this sport and why I have that passion. And then it's so cool to see the progression from day one to day three. These guys on day three are looking at stuff and pulling lines that day one, they would have looked at me like I was crazy. And that really makes me feel like I'm accomplishing something. I'm showing people something new and exciting and something that they can take home with them and they'll look at their writing area completely different and pretty sweet.
Joe over here. Fed? Ah. They don't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> we have a really good shot of it. Oh. We might have to take a couple <laughs> takes because I'm a giggler. You look like Madonna. What? I look like Madonna. I look like Madonna. That's not cool. We can't get some money for me. You just have to play this version of Blue Tears. <laughs> no. Oh. Oh, I have a police escort when I'm watching my trailer. It's no big deal. Trust the chest. Hey, Justin. Yeah. Do you want to give him a yank out real quick? A what? A pull out. Just a dodge? Yeah. What? Yell at him. Yell at him. Justin! I'm supposed to yell at you on this camera. Oh, it's not real? Uh, no, that was real. About going to get a chain. Why did you yell at me? I'm not yelling. <laughs> I'm just saying go get a chain and the skid steer and pull Aaron out. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> That's the second time you got that thing. That one has a mark. Slow it up there and see it.